Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, as you can see, we are the uh, panel on PM 2.5 uh, health effects and control. The panelists include myself and uh, Professor Tom Keen of Mechanical Engineering Department. And then we have also Professor uh, Marshall Hertz and Professor Christine uh, Wendt of the medical school. And then uh, the last one uh, is Professor Ramit Chandran from the School of Public Health. So we are very happy to share with you uh, on this uh, topic. So I will go first. Um, I will talk about PM 2.5 in China, sources, effects, and control. So you probably see that uh, picture to the left is Beijing and to the right is uh, Shanghai. Now PM 2.5 uh, describe a particulate matter that is two and a half micron diameter and smaller. It turns out that two and a half micron uh, and smaller, those are from uh, man-made pollution, whereas a uh, larger size could be from dust storm and others. Now US EPA uh, set a 24 hour standards at 35 microgram of uh, particle mass over a uh, cubic meter of uh, volume of, of air. And uh, so in US it's 35. Now last few years in Beijing, oftentimes uh, it can exceed uh, 500. So it's more than 10 times higher. And uh, early this uh, heating season in November, Harbin exceed uh, 1,000. So uh, that result in shutdown of airport and all that everybody stay at home. So it's a serious uh, problem. Now, uh, many studies shows that coal combustion in the power plants and the automobile emissions account for 70% of the overall PM 2.5. So in order to do any good in controlling PM 2.5, we need to get those two sources under control. Now health effects, uh, my colleagues in the medical school can tell you, uh, include cardiovascular, respiratory diseases, and cancers. Uh, now recently, just about uh, six months ago, there's a proceeding of National Academy of Sciences article that estimated that northern Chinese, due to the fact that uh, uh, north of uh, Wei River, uh, which cut across the middle section of China. Uh, north of that, the government provide free coal for heating, home heating for many years, uh, and the South do not have that. And so as a result of this policy, uh, they estimated that Northern Chinese has five years less life expectancy than the Southern China Chinese. And uh, now PM 2.5 can be controlled using backhouse filters uh, for coal fire power plants and a diesel particulate filter, gasoline particulate filter for automobiles. So the control technology do exist, so uh, that can do some good on it. Now, how about uh, China uh, tackle the PM 2.5? Uh, government is really quite serious about controlling that. This is one of the most urgent uh, problem in China. So. In September, uh, the uh, National Action Plan was implemented uh, requiring that uh, PM 2.5 in the Beijing Tian Tianjin uh, nor northern area uh, be reduced by 25%, uh, in Yangtze River, Shanghai area by 20%, and uh, in the Pearl River, uh, uh, Guangzhou area uh, by 15%. By, uh, and they also asked that uh, Beijing uh, should be controlled annual average uh, to 60 microgram per cubic meter. Earlier, I was talking about 24 hours uh, average. So this is annual average. But Beijing has an annual average about 110. So they wanted to reduce to 60 microgram per cubic meter by 2015. So that's a, a very uh, difficult task to do that. And also the National Action Plan requires that U.S. $277 billion be invested over the next five years to prevent and control PM 2.5. By the way, this article was written by uh, Dr. Chen Zhu. Uh, uh, some of you may remember that he came here 
two years ago to <coughs> receive an honorary uh, doctorate of the University of Minnesota. And currently, he's the vice chairman of the National People's of Congress, so he's one of the top leaders uh, in China. So uh, U of M uh, and our Center for Futurian Research are ready to help. Uh, President uh, Kaler and uh, our Science and Engineering College Dean, Stephen Crouch, will lead a de delegation of uh, 15 faculty members from Science and Engineering Medical School and School of Public Health. In fact, five of, of us will be on that delegation, so you get a preview of uh, what we are going to do in Xi'an. And uh, uh, so we uh, are going to do a bilateral seminar uh, with uh, equal number of Chinese Academy of Sciences colleagues uh, to talk about how we can do, what we can do in terms of uh, prevention and control. And uh, I have a Center for Futurian Research uh, uh, which consists of 15 companies, uh, uh, very large companies that uh, produce uh, $20 billion of Futurian products uh, representing about one third of the world supply. And I'm very happy that when I invite them to go to Xi'an, Actually, this was early. Right now, there are 27 uh, of them from uh, uh, nine companies going. So, so uh, in fact, this group would be bigger than the, the U of M and CAS group together. So they want to do something to help China. Now, finally, uh, last year, I received uh, Einstein's professorship from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So they invited me to give a PM 2.5 talk uh, all over China, and I gave talk uh, at <coughs> six universities, including Tsinghua, USTC, UCAS, and all that, and also four research institutes. And it's a 15 minutes uh, talk, so I cannot tell you too much. But I can tell you the concluding slides is this one. Can you recognize where we are? Beijing, right, Forbidden City. So my talk, uh, include uh, uh, talking about the sources of air pollution, coal burning and vehicle emissions. And then as a result of that, uh, there will be a health effects problem, visibility effect problem. Uh, I indicate in here, uh, academia gear, uh, because uh, academia uh, researchers can, can best uh, to study on the sources and effects. And then when the effects are getting bad, the government uh, will come in uh, now, government in China is a big gear. They just talk about investing 277 billion US dollars uh, next five years. So it's a very important gear that can uh, uh, set regulations on PM 2.5 and uh, also this are the automobile emission standards. And when government sets standard, industry can step in providing uh, state-of-the-art technology to, uh, for, for example, backhouse for Fire power plant, diesel particulate filter, gasoline particulate filter for controlling vehicle emissions. Now, uh, so this is turning, and then if the three can work together, I call it integrative uh, uh, approach to turning the gear together, and that would turn the PM 2.5 progress wheel uh, in the direction that will help to improve sources, improve effects, and continue to turn. So in order to do that, we want all these three to turn in the same direction, isn't it? Let's see if it works. Aha, uh -huh. it's uh, indeed turning in the right direction. And as it turns, uh, every time it turns, the effect will be lessened, right? So in the end, you find out where you are, right? <laughs> so that's my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now the next talk will be my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Tom Keen from Mechanical Engineering Department. What does 5, 6 mean? Oh, Euro 5, Euro 6. This is a, a steadily increasing uh, string, stringent standard. So right now, China is doing Euro 4. So probably by next year, it will be Euro 5, <coughs> and probably a couple of years later, it will be Euro 6. Okay. Well, as David said, I'm uh, Professor Tom Keen in the Mechanical Engineering Department here. And mechanical engineers always want to solve problems. 
And uh, one of the problems that's often overlooked is, is emission sources from cooking. It turns out that this is the largest source of particulates indoors, both in residences and commercial buildings, with the exception of smoking. Again, if, if there's someone smoking in, in the room, that's probably not the case. Uh, if you look at the, the data here, these are some measured indoor concentrations of, as David said, particulate matter 2.5 particles, 2.5 microns and smaller, in units of micrograms per cubic meter. Typical food court in the US, you go to a mall and the food court takes some measurements, about 200. A Hunan restaurant uh, measured in China, 1,400. <laughs> Cantonese restaurant, 672. Hot pot restaurant, 81. So again, the numbers vary. Really depends on the food being cooked and the temperature of the, the appliance. The higher the temperature of the appliance, generally the more um, emission. So think of a Chinese wok. Okay, it's fairly hot, right? And this is actually the highest emitting uh, cooking appliance we've measured. The highest is actually a solid fuel mesquite charcoal fired uh, grill cooking hamburger. This is number two. Hmm. It's also a significant source outdoors. As we talk about the air pollution in, in China in general, we're typically talking outdoor pollution. So if you look at the US PM 2.5 emissions in terms of tons per year for the whole country, and we look at cooking, primarily the high temperature char broiling versus all the highway vehicles in the whole country, all the cars, all the buses, all the trucks together. So the entire fleet is about 135,000. Cooking is on the order of 80,000. So it's about two thirds of the entire fleet of vehicles in the whole country. So it's not insignificant. So some data, we think of cooking, we think of restaurants. That's the commercial side of things. Uh, if you go down to a restaurant or go down to a grocery store, buy a loaf of bread, that bread had to be cooked in a bakery someplace, that's a commercial kitchen. You buy a can of soup, that'd be produced in a commercial kitchen someplace. So it's not only the retail side, it's also the food processing side. So in terms of the retail side, restaurant data, uh, the US is about a million restaurants, China about two and a half million, 64,000 in the state of California, 41,000 just in the city of Beijing alone. So Beijing alone has about two thirds of restaurants in the entire state of California. National sales, you can see 660 for the US, about 268 for China. Total number of employees, about the same. It's about 10% of the US workforce. And estimates are that one out of every three workers in the US has at some time worked in the food industry. Typically a fast food restaurant, maybe when they're in high school or they're starting out in college, something like that. So it's a very good training ground for, for full-time employment. Now, what are the emission regulations so far in this country? Well, there's not much. There's no, no national regulation, really no state regulations. The, the main regulation comes from the Los Angeles Basin in, in California called the South Coast Air Quality Management District. They have a, a rule of five milligrams per cubic meter or less for the restaurants that use these char broilers. Uh, for China, there's a somewhat similar regulation, two milligrams per cubic meter, which is uh, significantly lower than the US current standard. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area also has the five milligram per cubic meter, but those are really the only two regions in, in the states that have a, a regulation in place. Now that five milligrams or two milligram is not a really good measure. If, you, if you're producing, say, seven, gram, seven milligrams per cubic meter, all you have to do is dilute it with some <coughs> clean air and get down to five. Or if you're producing five, just dilute it with clean air and get down to two. So you can take any restaurant and just bring in more outside air, either in the seating area, which is over in the left, or the um, cooking kitchen area over on the right, bring in more blue air, exhaust more air, it can get your concentration down to whatever you want. So we don't think that's a really good number, and there are some of us trying to fix that, put a more realistic number in terms of total mass emissions per day or something like that. So where do we go from here? Well, the majority of residential and commercial cooking remains uncontrolled. How many of you have set off a fire alarm in your house when you've cooked something in the oven, right? So that, that happens. How many of you don't have exhaust outside from your kitchen, recirculating exhaust? That's very common in the US here too. So we need new approaches, both for residential and commercial uh, applications. So novel cooking appliances. This is called a clamshell grill that McDonald's has adopted now. It's much lower emissions, cooks the hamburgers more quickly on both sides. It's more energy efficient. Uh, so they're using this now in their restaurant chain in the US. Better emission control system. This is a cyclone filter, which is a second stage filter. Better grease collection efficiency in the exhaust hood. Reduces the grease collection in the exhaust ducts, fire hazard, and so on. So that, that's ongoing. There's an ASTM standard of tests that we developed in our lab that's, that's pushing this. 
and better sensors and, and control methods. And here we're looking at measuring the exhaust air through a set of alpha filters right in the uh, TCF Bank Stadium just across the street here. This is one of our uh, 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 test locations. So with that, I'll leave you with this, this uh, thought that there was a study about 15 years ago in China that the Chinese woman had a higher incidence of lung cancer than the Chinese men, but the men did most of the smoking. So where does exposure come from? Well, it's probably in the kitchen doing the cooking. And I'll leave you with that thought. Okay, so you will have opportunity to ask questions at the end. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Marshall Hoods. Uh, he is the Director of uh, Center for Lung Sciences and uh, Health, and uh, also uh, director, Medical Director of Lung Transportation, uh, Transplantation. Am I in charge or are you in charge? I'm in charge, okay. Just oh, they're all in order. Oh, okay. Continue Great. to. Yeah, yeah I got okay. it. I'm in charge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Pui for inviting me, uh, not only to this seminar, but also to join the U.S. Uh, the university delegation uh, to the bilateral summit in uh, in Xi'an. And um, uh, we only have three slides limit today, so I decided to use the first slide to tell you something I know about, and then to use the next two slides to tell you some things that I'm learning about as part of my preparation for this this visit, my first visit to China. Um, I am an expert in lungs, and I do know that mammalian lungs have been evolving for about 240 million years. And um, basically, the purpose of all this evolution is to bring oxygen into our bodies from the air and to get rid of carbon dioxide into the air. That's, that's the whole purpose of the lung. Um, the problem is, that the air itself is full of stuff that we don't need or want, um, including uh, germs, particulates, uh, various gases that are not good for us, and also um, dehydration is, is a problem. So the, the lungs have, have to evolve defense mechanisms against all of these problems. And um, as you can imagine, this all for 239,999,000 years, this went on in a pretty stable environment. So we were able to evolve in, 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 a, in a way that was consistent with the environment. And you may know the word homeostasis. I think homeostasis is the most important word in our medical vocabulary. And it refers to the ability of living things to maintain a constant internal environment, no matter what happens outside. And it's one of the things that distinguishes living organisms from a building or a car, which will deteriorate as the environment works on it. We can restore ourselves more or less, at least for the first 100 years. Um, now, um, what's happened is that in the last 100 years, the environment has changed radically. Um, way outpacing the, the uh, ability of evolution to keep up. Um, there's been an exponential growth, growth in what's now called the exposome, which is all the junk uh, that the engineers tell us is in the air, including carbon dioxide, particulates, and other, other pollutants. As I mentioned, there's been zero change in our respiratory system over 100 years. We, we can't evolve that quickly. And so what you have seen is an exponential growth in respiratory disease. Um, Dr. Wen is going to talk uh, in probably more detail than I will about the burden of disease. Um, but uh, just to give you an example, the, the uh, uh, World Health Organization estimates that air pollution kills about 7 million people per year worldwide. Um, about half of those are from indoor stoves, the estimate is. Um, which I guess isn't a new e event in evolution, but still, a few thousand years, or a couple of million maybe since fire was tamed. Um, in China alone, uh, the 
uh, WHO estimates that about half a million people die every year from uh, outdoor air, air pollution and at least an equal number of people from indoor air pollution. Um, and just to give you an idea of the scope of, of what's going on, when the first Chinese student came to the United States in 1914, there were about half a million cars in the whole world. Now there are about a billion automobiles and trucks in the entire world. And in 10 years, China will have a billion automobile and trucks. So that's, that number is going to double in 10 years compared to what we have now. Now I've got one minute left for my last, for, to describe what's going to happen in the next 100 years. Uh, and it's simple. Uh, we could replace and repair all the damaged lungs. That's what I've spent my career doing is I'm a lung transplant physician. And what I've learned is that's just not going to happen. <laughs> in, in the entire world, we only do about 2,500 transplants a year. And even if all the dead people could donate all their organs, it still wouldn't be enough uh, to satisfy the growing need. Um, can we grow new lungs? Obviously, we've got bioengineering uh, going on. We've got stem cell research. We've got a lot of scientists trying to grow new organs. Um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime in the immediate future. We're not going to be growing lungs on trees. Uh, what we need to do is clean up the air. Um, and when I started on this little project to give this talk, I was pretty pessimistic. I thought, wow, that's a lot of dirt. A lot of PM 2.5, a lot of cars, a lot of coal. Um, now I'm more optimistic. Um, experts in the area, the WHO, the World Bank, all of the engineering associations think that this can be done under two <coughs> circumstances. One is if there's political will to do it, meaning governments. Number two, if there's money. And uh, Dr. Pui mentioned $250 million, roughly. 270. 270 billion, billion sorry. <laughs> uh, the number I came across was a, a trillion dollars to clean up the whole world. Mm. And in my opinion, as a non-expert, I think you know, about 70% of all the money in America is spent on consumer goods. And if we cut that down to 60%, spent 10% more on cleaning up the air, that would probably do it. Um, I think China is finally critical in this entire process. Um, you know, if you, just by virtue of its size, and China, by the way, did not start the problem, all right? The Europeans and the Americans started the problem. Um, but I think it's gonna be up to the Chinese to solve it. Um, right now, of every person, sorry, of all the smokers in the entire world, uh, one third live in China. And of all the coal burned in the entire world, one half is burned in China. So the, just the, 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 the weight of the numbers um, mandates that, that the cleanup um, be really led and focused on uh, China and the rest of the Eastern Hemisphere. Thank you. So, so next is... Uh, Professor Christine Wendt, uh, she is a professor of medicine and section chief of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at the VA Medical Center. Um, good afternoon. <clears throat> um, I'm a lung expert as well, and actually everything I know I learned from Dr. Hurt, so I'm not sure what I can really add uh, onto that talk. Um, one of the interesting things is uh, this, for all of us from Minnesota, my husband sent an article um, <laughs> saying that we can actually blame um, our bad winter on the air pollution in China, that it's actually having weather effects, and they could account some of the changes in snowstorms that then subsequently hit us. So maybe this bad April was um, <laughs> um, not our fault after all. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail because the lung, I'm a little bit biased. The, the lung is an important organ um, and is the conduit for um, air pollution's effects on the body. It's not a new thought that air pollution um, can have a health effect. Uh, there are writings from the 1600s in London where they describe these stink fogs that came through the city and that they had increased death in the next days that followed. And since that time, 
And there have been um, reports both in developed and developing countries around the world that when there's, an, there's this phenomenon that when you see an increase in pollution, it doesn't have to be a huge amount of increase in pollution, that in the next 24, 48 hours, you'll see more hospitalizations and more deaths. And usually those deaths are cardio, heart, or lung related. And so it's interesting that there's a connection both with the heart. It makes sense that it would be with the lung. And also around the world, both in developing and um, developed countries, that uh, mortality will follow um, the amount of pollution. That is, the more pollution, the higher mortality. And again, it seems to affect the heart and the lungs. And so people who ha have disease, and I have one of the diseases up there, it's a disease that I study, chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a disease that we usually associate with smoking, but can be seen with other forms of pollution in the lung. And lung cancer, these are vulnerable people that seem to be more susceptible to um, pollution. And so when you look at the mortality after there's increased pollution either over a short period of time or a long period of time, these people are more susceptible. But also heart disease. And the elderly and women as well seem to be more susceptible. So why is that? Well, the lung is an interesting, it's a great organ. We all need it to live. <clears throat> and besides bringing in the oxygen, getting rid of, rid of carbon dioxide, it also is a good filter. And it's pretty good at trying to get rid of particles. And so the this, the 10 and the 2.5 is the size of the particle. The 10 micron is the bigger, it might be the dust. Your nose is good at filtering that. You have these um, ridges in your nose, turbinates. You've got little cells that have little fingers on them that can remove the dust. But the smaller particles can sneak down into the lung. Again, the lung is good. You know, right now I have a cold. I have a really good cough um, reflex. You can try to get rid of those particles. We have little cells that can try to clear it. But some of those particles can get embedded. And the, and the lung, as you get smaller and smaller, has these tiny little air sacs that are 200 microns. And so these 2.5 microns can make their way all the way down to the little air sacs in the lung where the oxygen goes across. And some of even the smaller particles that are man-made, the ultrafine that um, we describe, that are one or less microns, Many of those, they're so small, we breathe them in, they come out, they may get clogged in our nose, but they're so small they can actually make it between the cells in your lung and get into your bloodstream or get and then go to your heart and other vital organs. So why is it? So it sort of makes sense that if you have sick lungs that pollution would be bad, right? So I have a bad cold and now after, after Professor Keene's talk, I'm kind of wondering if last night when I made... Um, my uh, stir fry that it might have made my cold worse. <laughs> my curry chicken wasn't a good thing and I didn't turn on my fan, so maybe that's why my cold is worse today. But um, it sort of makes intuitive sense that if you have bad lungs that um, you can be more susceptible. But the lung is primed to fight um, uh, foreign bodies, um, uh, other bacteria, so it has inflammatory cells. And so when it sees something foreign, it'll start to attack it. And that, uh, those effects can be local or it can, be, um, it can spread into the bloodstream and affect other organs. So that can explain why, even though there's increase in pollution, why you can have heart problems as well. One of the things that isn't known or is less known and is just starting to be uncovered is does pollution, so we know that it may increase mortality, it may, um, People who have sick lungs may be more prone to go to the hospital, but does it actually cause disease? Well, I think there's good evidence now that indoor smoke, which we've talked about with cooking, and there's four um, studies from China, will actually predispose people to get a chronic disease, this chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And there's a new study that just came out this last month in the Netherlands that showed women who live close to traffic who are exposed to dusts and pollutants are more likely to also get COPD, even if they don't smoke. So what we don't know is how much disease is, is actually caused from the pollution itself, just not making other pollution worse. Um, many people who have COPD, it's very prevalent. We talked about this in China. Upwards of 60 to 70 percent of men smoke. And so there's a lot of hidden disease. Um, usually people don't present 
with their symptoms so they've lost half their lung function. So I suspect there's a lot of people in China who actually have hidden disease that is caused not necessarily from their smoking, but also from their exposure to pollution, and that this is a healthcare crisis waiting to happen. And I'll end there and leave the rest for Ron. So our last uh, panelist is uh, Professor Raman Ch Chandran. Uh, he is a professor in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences in the School of Public Health. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, David, for inviting me to this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, so I um, study uh, the assessment, or assessment of human exposures to various kinds of pollution, mainly air pollution, both in you know, urban and indoor settings, such as what we have talked, some of the previous panelists have talked about, uh, and also in workplace environments, in factories and so on, where workers are exposed to uh, you know, high degrees of pollution due to the various industrial processes going on. And uh, I've uh, participated in several studies uh, looking at the relationship uh, between these exposures that workers or you know, citizens in a city uh, face and their uh, health outcomes, uh, you know, COPD and lung cancer and cardiovascular disease and so on. And so uh, after uh, the other panelists have spoken, it's a nice introduction to what I'm planning to talk about, which is uh, how can we address some of the needs for research uh, in China relating to uh, air pollution. Um, most of the studies that have been done in China so far address uh, short-term exposures and their health effects. So a, a research study will happen that looks at exposures over uh, you know, a few months uh, at most, a uh, few weeks sometimes, and then uh, so one snapshot of exposure and then what is the prevalence of disease. Uh, however, we know from studies done in the U.S. and in Europe uh, that uh, some of the profound uh, effects of air pollution take many years, many decades, uh, to become apparent. And so we need to conduct such studies in China. Uh, and the other thing is uh, that has sort of not occurred in China so far uh, is that the studies of PM 2.5 and their health effects, uh, they have not been done. There have been some measurements of PM 2.5 in a few places in China but no systematic study of their health effects uh, that have been done, for example, in the US and Europe. And so we need to uh, carry out a systematic study of exposures of people to PM2.5 and also PM1, which is uh, exposure to even smaller particles that are primarily from combustion-related sources. And as uh, David uh, and uh, you know, uh, Tom pointed out in their presentations, the main sources in China, or two of the biggest sources are you know, coal combustion, uh, both for indoor cooking as well as in power plants, and then also from vehicular exhaust. These are the main things, so it's an important thing to measure. Uh, so we need to measure exposures to these different uh, sources of particulate matter. And also, uh, moving on to the health effects, there are a variety of health effects associated, as some of the previous speakers talked about, COPD, lung cancer and cardiovascular effects being some of the main ones. Uh, we can measure the exposures, uh, and I'll talk about some of the methods in a second, but we can also measure some of the markers of disease. Uh, so uh, we can, uh, and uh, Dr. Wendt is an expert in this, looking at biomarkers uh, from human tissue, blood samples and so on, and analyzing them for various proteins uh, that are uh, linked to disease, or that are early, early signals of disease. Um, and uh, there, there are more traditional markers of disease, such as uh, spirometry, which is where you breathe into a machine and the amount of volume we breathe in and out in a certain amount of time is an indicator of uh, how uh, healthy or not healthy your lungs are. And chest x-rays, so these are sort of more traditional measures, but then there are also newer uh, cutting edge ways of measuring uh, disease. Uh, so um, I'm in the School of Public Health and we do studies of uh, epidemiological studies. And so there are several possible designs we can adopt 
to uh, address this uh, issue. Um, and since my background is partly in occupational uh, health, uh, one of the advantages of combining an occupational cohort of people along with a non-occupational cohort is we can sort of tease out the differences or the contributions from each one of these sources. Um, the second advantage is that, uh, as I said, many of these effects uh, of air pollution take many, many years, decades sometimes, uh, to be for their health effects to become apparent. So we need a stable cohort of people uh, so that we can trace back their exposures over many decades. And an occupational environment where workers have been in industry for 10, 15, 20 years that offer a ready-made population for uh, such a study to happen. Uh, and so if we use workers in an industry, um, uh, such as the coal power plant, uh, and their spouses, this would offer a nice population to study. Uh, so we could look at the exposures of the workers and coal combustion, for example, um, in a coal power plant, and non-occupational uh, exposures, such as vehicular exhaust and indoor air pollution that uh, Dr. Tom Keane talked about uh, in their homes, uh, and uh, look at these two groups and uh, find the effects of each and how much they contribute to the disease burden. Uh, another possible study is to look at, um, you know, if some of the interventions that are being proposed, like ga you know, filtration and so on, um, uh, both in uh, power plants as well as um, uh, in car you know, devices, cars and so on, uh, can we look at a, uh, a part of the city or a city where such intervention has occurred and a control city where it has not occurred and study populations in these two locations? Um, my final slide, uh, so here are sort of a list of measurements that we uh, bring to bear on such a study. So we measure, like I said, PM 2.5, PM 1. Uh, we can also measure the surface area uh, of these particles, uh, uh, and that has been shown in a number of studies to be very relevant to health effects. Uh, monitoring them at uh, both the home and outdoors, as well as, of course, the work environment. Uh, we, can, we have the capability to model these exposures so that we can trace back the exposure that occurred 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, if there are no data available going back that. And uh, finally, like I uh, mentioned earlier, we can measure a variety of health endpoints, COPD, lung cancer, and cardiovascular diseases, uh, and biomarkers of disease. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, so that's a brief sketch of uh, possible studies that we can do going forward. Thank you. So here are the uh, presentation by the five uh, uh, panelists. I, I should mention that when we go to Xi'an, there will be three times more of us, and each of us will give three times longer talk, uh, plus there's equal number of uh, Chinese uh, delegates uh, from Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, I should just mention that uh, last May, when President Kaler went to Beijing, he and his wife went to uh, the Great Wall. Uh, unfortunately, on that day, the PM 2.5 is 500. US standard is 35. So afterwards, he told me that, David, you know, when we went to the Great Wall, we cannot see beyond my arm reach. So you go all the way to Great Wall and see the wall only, so without seeing the greatness. <laughs> so therefore, President Kaler really understand how important this is. So this time, he uh, personally will lead us to go to China for this bilateral seminar. So we have how many minutes for, uh, five minutes for Q&As? Yeah, uh, you raise your hands first, yes. So our lungs are not developed to deal with these particles. But is there any study done like for people who have been exposed to for a long time, you know, maybe when they're little, and then uh, compared to the people who have never exposed? So what I'm thinking is that the travelers, so the people who are living in China, and then for the people who, for example, from the US, you know, go there, what kind of uh, consequences could there be some kind of immunity they would develop over time? Well, I think that's a great question. It's also a very complicated question to, 
to answer or to study. <clears throat> I know that certainly um, the experience in uh, Los Angeles and other places where there have been dramatic reductions in air pollution um, indicate that there are definitely reductions in short-term health outcomes and probably we assume long-term health outcomes. Out for long -term as well. um, but I don't know what would happen, you know, to these sort of um, part-time travelers or, or Dr. Kaler would, would have had a, a chance of becoming ill there, you know, from such a short-term exposure. Um, one thing I, I do know uh, is that um, one, of, one of my colleagues in uh, Belgium who's a lung transplant specialist has a son who's an expert in air quality and air pollution. And they've done a, a very interesting study where the lifespan of people with transplanted lungs is shorter uh, as they live closer to a major highway. So the more air pollution there is, even in that short period of time, maybe three, four, five years, that they've been able to measure that there, there are differences in, in survival. So again, as maybe Dr. Wendt intimated, if your lungs aren't normal to begin with, you're at much, much higher risk of, from these environmental disturbances. But we think for normal lungs, it's probably repeated exposure and, and the intermittent traveler is, is probably somewhat safe. Well, there's a limit too. I mean, if, if there were a fire in this room and we were all exposed right. to massive smoke inhalation, we'd all die. So somewhere there's a, there, there's, there's a bell-shaped curve. Uh, that there's a dose yeah. and then exposure time. Yeah. A second question there? I, I'm terribly sorry. Um, we will have to finish our session um, due to time constraints. However, we will have a social hour at 4 o'clock in the Heritage Gallery. If you'd like to direct further questions, that may be a good time. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this panel discussion. Thank you.